What's going on, everyone? Taylor Kyle's here for CLNS Media, coming at you with another episode of Pats Daily, brought to you by our good friends at Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of CLNS. It's another mailbag episode. We're just over a week away from the draft, thank God. One of the busiest times of the year. It's obviously really fun getting to know all these prospects, but you know we're reaching the point where it's like, all right, let's get these picks in. Let's see who these new members of the team are going to be and help answer your mailbag questions, help go over some of these pre-draft questions. I got my good buddy, Alex Katzen on. Very excited. He works for the Huskies Wire, the Chargers Wire, and the Sorry No Pod Today podcast, one of the busiest people I personally know. Very excited for you to be making your first appearance, buddy. How you doing? Doing good, man. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm uh, here in my uh, very yellow lit uh, <laughs> office here, um, away from my normal location. But, you know, it's not doing my complexion any favors, but, you know, we'll take it. Um, and, uh, you know, onwards, uh, onwards and upwards from here. And this is completely my fault because I don't know the difference between East Coast time <laughs> and Pacific time. Even though I spent two years in L.A., you'd think I'd have wised up at some point, but I have not. But you're an absolute baller. I appreciate you adjusting for me. So before we get into these questions, the great questions from our viewers, the Patriots actually acknowledged that Michael Penix Jr. existed. Now, it seemed like maybe this was a weird smokescreen because Tyler Hughes obviously worked at Washington. So it was like, all right, maybe they just don't want to tip their hand, but they're finally going to have him in for a dinner tonight. And tomorrow they're going to officially host him for a 30 visit. Obviously, you are very close with the Huskies and you cover them closely. So Sell the Patriots fans, all right? Obviously, Michael Penix Jr., he's not Drake May, he's not Jaden Daniels, he's not those guys, but he's still a good quarterback with some deficiencies, admittedly. So, you know, obviously, you've got the injury history, you got the wonky mechanics, the accuracy, you know, isn't great, kind of more of a javelin thrower than a guy who really mixes in touch. But try to sell Patriots fans, if you can, on Michael Penix Jr. as a prospect if he winds up in New England. Yeah, absolutely. I think, like, the main thing with Mike is that you're going to get uh, someone who like every time you talk to Mike, he talks about the importance of competing and like how much he loves to compete and how much he loves to just like be on the football field. And like you saw that with like he's the only quarterback that ran 40 um, of like the top prospects. He's the only quarterback that, you know, did a lot of the testing. He's one of the only quarterbacks that threw at the combine. Uh, he went to the senior bowl. He did everything in his pro day, um, you know, uh, ran a blazing 40 in his pro day, um, which uh, now that I think about it, it was just his pro day, he didn't run at the combine, but uh, he teased running at the combine like he was going to. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, he's just like, he's just the ultimate competitor. And e- everyone that you talk to from around the Washington program and from uh, from around the, the city um, that followed that run will tell you that he's just the ultimate competitor. Um, as far as like skill set, I don't necessarily think that there's like a huge drop off between him and the top guys, but like you mentioned, the the injury history and the advanced age and everything, he turns 25 pretty soon, um, is going to play a factor in that projection, right? Where like with Drake May, Jaden Daniels, I mean, Jaden is a little bit of a different case because he was a fifth year senior with like one year of like super high production, obviously won the Heisman. Um, but like with Drake May or like a guy like JJ McCarthy or someone like that, right? Like you're getting a younger player that like you can look past some of those flaws maybe because like there's room, there's more room for them to develop. With Mike, he's been in college for six years, you know, like he's had plenty of time to develop and, you know, become the player that he is. Um, but I think that there's still a lot there that's uh, that's left untapped, right? I mean, like, this is a guy that's running the four fives in the 40 and he barely scrambled at all at Washington. Um, he did a lot more of it back when he was at Indiana, um, but then obviously with the injury history and everything, I will tell you that like, uh, from talking to people at the combine and talking to people like at Freda and everything, that like, the injury history is bad, of course. Like it's a it's a long it's a long list. Um, it looks like a CVS receipt, but it's not as bad as people were expecting it to be. Um, and so there's been a little bit less concern than people thought that there was going to be about that injury history with him. Um, and yeah, you know, like you brought up the mechanics and stuff too. It looked like at pro day during his throwing script, he really shortened those up, cleaned it up a little bit. Um, me and uh, my coworker at Husky's Wire, Ben Glassmeyer, who's a, a great guy for all that sort of stuff, um, does all of our breakdowns over there and everything. Um, we're the ones that noticed that, that it really looked like he that was something that he focused on in training and he had really cleaned up those mechanics. Whether or not that's a consistent thing that stretches into the season with you know a 
an NFL quarterback coach versus like his private coach and everything is obviously remain to be seen. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of there's still a lot of untapped potential with Mike, um, despite the injury history and the age and like uh, he is going to be one of those guys that like if he succeeds, there's going to be ESPN athletic all those sorts of articles written about just like how relentless he was in getting better and competing every day um, to be the best quarterback that he possibly can. Yeah, if you're talking about off-field stuff, man, it doesn't really get much more encouraging than Michael Penix Jr. Obviously, extremely mentally tough. You talk about one or two of those injuries in a career, guys are going to start to question how much they really love the game, but obviously shows his passion, the fact that he stuck to it. Pro days are usually, I think, really overhyped. I don't think there's a whole lot of value to them, to be totally honest. But one thing that is really cool to see is when you do see that growth in mechanics. And it's like, oh, this guy's clearly working on something behind the scenes. And then you actually get to see it come to fruition. I also saw in the comments, there were people being like, oh, Michael Penix Jr. at three. He's not going to three. I don't think that's I don't think that's a no, consideration. No, no, no. Right. But this is more like if they trade back, you're talking about getting 11 and 23 and you're going to pick a quarterback later. That's kind of the area that we're talking about Michael Penix Jr. in. But you said Jamie G. McCarthy's name and like the devil, you say it, he shall appear. So first question, <laughs> what are your thoughts on J.J. McCarthy's arm strength and the fairly pronounced footwork he seems to require to really fire it with extra RPMs? Yeah, you know, I think that J.J. is um, – I would call him probably an average thrower of the ball. Um, I don't think that obviously like you, you see guys like Joe Milton in this draft class that can throw an orange 110 yards and he's going to go outside to do all the deep balls in his pro day because he's launched them like 800 feet in the air and everything. And like, that's not JJ. That's never going to be JJ. Um, as far as footwork, that is like, that is a, a really astute observation. I do think that there's a little bit of overstriding that he does um, in order to generate a little bit more velocity on the ball that can sometimes uh, spray his accuracy a little bit. Um, you know, like you always want to keep that that footwork uh, that tight uh, tighter to enable you to throw the ball more accurately. Um, and I do notice that a little bit with his film. Um, but ultimately, I think that he is someone who is going to have an average NFL arm. I mean, like if you think about a guy like uh, like Joe Burrow or Brock Purdy or like some of these guys like that aren't known necessarily for being like super hard throwers of the ball, but win in other areas, right? Where like with Burrow and with Purdy and um, even with a guy like, you know, to, not to get blasphemous, right? But even with a guy like Brady, right? Towards the end, um, where it's like you're winning and in the margins with a guy like J.J. McCarthy. You're not winning with elite physical talent. Um, and so I think like if you are a team that's high on J.J., you're high on that part of it. You're not high on, oh, he's going to be able to throw it 80 yards down the field and we're going to be able to launch it to a guy like Tyquan Fulton every mm -hmm. other play um, to like generate the most explosive offense that there's ever been. Um, it's going to be a lot more short passing game, a lot more like asking him to read a defense, um, a lot more stuff like that, which is all stuff that he did at Michigan and did fairly well. Um, and so I do think that it is going to be something that like he gets knocked for because he doesn't have the same arm as these other top guys in the draft. But I don't think it's going to be something that like prevents him from being a great quarterback in the NFL, because ultimately, like, that's not the way that he won in Michigan. And that's not the way that he's going to win in the NFL either. Yeah, with McCarthy, the arm strength and maybe it's just because he throws BBs like all the time. I feel like his arm strength is like just better than Jaden Daniels, but obviously those guys like are not in the conversation of like Caleb Williams or like Drake May, where those guys have pure arm talent, like four days. And even when you talk about the athleticism, maybe it's because JJ gets a lot of comparisons to Mac Jones, obviously like productive college program where they had a ton of studs around them. They didn't really need to do as much. Although I don't think that's as true for JJ. When you talk about the weapons he was throwing to like Mac Jones was throwing to a whole different breed of guys. But I do think yeah, he has just yeah. enough athleticism where it's like, yeah, the arm strength is never going to wow anybody. He can still drive it into those tight windows. But I think, again, he's just athletic enough where he can extend plays. He can make things happen. He can scramble all that stuff. And then another thing that I really like about him that some of the guys in this class I don't see as much is that aggressiveness and the willingness to throw downfield. Because, you know, Definitely. think about some guys. You'd rather have a guy where you're like, all right, rein it in, and like maybe you don't want to make that throw all the time than a guy who on the high-low is consistently going to try to throw short all the time. So 
when it comes to specifically the arm strength, I agree. It's not great or anything like that. But when you also talk about the fact that he could get bigger, like he's a young 21, looks like he still has size to grow. So you're hoping maybe it gets marginally better to the point where you're like, it's okay. So you're like, oh, it's pretty solid. But, you know, I still think he's got a decent enough arm for, like you said, what they're going to, he's going to be asked to do in the league, which is thrown over the middle of the field, you know, hit a fade every once in a while, but we're not asking you to hit a big post twice a game. All right. Sticking with some recent news. What would the price be to acquire Brandon Ayuk? Obviously, I don't even know if this is real. There was a smoke that he was going to get traded. Now it's his agents refuting that. Who knows what the case actually is? We won't know for sure until probably the draft. But from your perspective, what do you think it would take for a team to get him? I'm thinking it's going to be a haul because he's one of the best receivers in the NFL. Doesn't have the injury history like a Debo. Still very young. I don't even know why the 49ers would entertain getting rid of him. But if they did, what do you think it would cost? Um, I mean, for the Patriots specifically, more than they should be willing to pay, <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's going to cost a first round pick. And uh, I don't think you want to trade the third overall pick uh, for a guy like Brendan Ayuk, um, yeah. as great as he is, um, and everything like that. You know, I don't think that that's someone where you're going to say like, okay, cool. Yeah, let's trade a top five pick for a receiver for a quarterback that we don't have yet. Um, yeah. That is that doesn't really make a ton of sense to me i do think that it would probably be like a mid first rounder i mean like the teams that have been rumored obviously and again we don't know how much of this is real how much anything is real um you know with the draft coming so soon it, it's hard to tell uh what anything in reality is anymore yeah. Um, but yeah but obviously like some of the teams that have been rumored like the jaguars who pick 17 the steelers who pick 20th like Teams like that kind of in that range, I think what I would imagine would be what it would cost. Um, and if you're not one of those teams that's kind of in that middle range of the first round, then you're probably talking about like sending next year's first round pick along with like a couple of like maybe like a middle rounders or like a second or third rounder this year um, to like make up for the difference in the like depreciation value of sending a future pick rather than one this uh, in this draft class. Um, but yeah, it's it's going to take a haul, and uh, I have a feeling that it's going to play out similar to the Debo situation last year, where he requested a trade or requested a trade, um, and then the Niners just paid him the extension that he wanted. Um, I kind of had the feeling that like that's the same way that this is going to go with Ayuk. We don't have to beat this one over the head. We both agree it's going to take a lot. The Patriots shouldn't pay it. Leave it at that. That's somebody else's problem to think about. All right. Still on current events. Is the Camryon Richardson a man-to-man -man or press corner? Now, this is the Mississippi State cornerback the Patriots had in for a visit this weekend. I will say I briefly looked at the tape. I wanted to see how he looked against LSU. Did get be beaten pretty badly on a couple double moves. I'm not going to front. Although I thought the second one, he was like right in the hip. It's just that at the beginning of the route, it looked kind of bad, but he did recover. But for the most part, I thought, you know, the whole profile on him is he's a big guy. He's long. He's athletic. And you definitely see that. Like, he's running with these receivers stride for stride. It's not that he can't hang that way. I also think he's pretty fluid. Like, I think when he's on top of the route and has a good sense of what's going on, you do see he can drop his weight and get down on, like, dig routes and things like that. But what you saw, like, on the first album movie lost to was he gets stuck in the sand when he really gets beaten, and it took him a while to turn around a little bit. So from my perspective, I do think – he has that man coverage ability for sure. Ideally, if you're, you know, putting him against more big bodied receivers, kind of in that like Brandon Browner role, I feel like is the easiest for Pats fans to think of. Just handle the big physical guys. We're not asking you to handle like the fidgety, you know, explosive guys that are just going to like deke you out of your shoes. But what do you think? I know you profiled him for the Chargers, uh, big shot over there. So what do you think about him? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a guy, um, the Chargers went to that LSU Mississippi State game back in uh, like late September, early October. Um, and so he's a guy that I've talked about um, with my work over at Get His Charge, a Chargers podcast that I uh, collaborate with frequently. Um, and he actually has a pre-draft visit with the Chargers as well. So it, it's kind of a nice confluence of interest here. Um, with, like I've been doing a little bit of work on him as well in, in recent days. Um, I definitely do agree. I think that he's going to be a better man corner. Um, I think that like ideally you do want to make use of that length. Um, and kind of get him into more of a press role where he can like jam guys up. Um, he does have sprint speed. I mean, he ran a 1075 uh, 10, 100 meter in high school, uh, 2163, 200. Um, you know, so like he's a, like, he's a good athlete. Um, yeah. He high jumped 6'4 in high school. Like this is a springy, like 
twitched up guy, um, but it's all in a straight line, like you mentioned. Like, it, if it's a guy, like, if you're asking him to cover someone in the slot or something, right, where it's a guy that's gonna, like, <laughs> do some, like, Jacoby Myers moves on him, like, right. he, it's not gonna work out, out well for you or for him. Um, and so definitely, I think getting him on the outside, kind of like having him jam receivers, uh, like right at the stem before they can get out, um, is going to be more kind of like what his role is going to look like. Um, and so I definitely agree in, in that respect. Um, and I'm interested to see like how high he goes. I know in the spring people, um, like had him in the like borderline day two, day three range. Um, and now it kind of, it seems like he'll definitely be a day three pick. Um, but he's gotten a lot of interest recently. And so I'm kind of interested to see like where he ends up falling. Yeah. And in his defense, like you're talking about jamming, the Patriots really do like to, especially against the good quarterbacks, they'll show cover one, they switch to cover two. That's probably one of their most popular zone coverages other than three, which everybody plays a ton. And I will say his run defense is very good. I was really impressed with his willingness to get involved in that department and what he brings as a tackler. Like he's a big dude and you really do see it when he's taking on ball carriers. So he's an interesting prospect. I think maybe he might be limited early on with the patch, just maybe in that coverage based role, just so you can kind of get him in situations where he really thrives. But because of his ability to play in that kind of cloud coverage and the run defense, I do think long-term if the Patriots got him, he would be able to maybe be that guy across from Christian Gonzalez long-term. All right, we got a lot more great questions to cover, but first, quick word from our friends at Prize Picks. We'll be right back. Get in on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason. You can win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000 with basketball and hockey entries today on Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Price Picks is the best way to get action on sports in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. I personally love Price Picks because they're super easy to use, easy to navigate, and they offer injury insurance, so your entries stay live even if one of your players gets injured. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what make Price Picks the number one fantasy sports app. Download the app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, we're going to get into a little would you rather scenario with two of my favorite wide receiver <laughs> prospects, guys. That if the Patriots leave with one of these guys, I will be over the moon as long as, you know, Drake May is the first pick for them overall. But <laughs> Javon Baker or Xavier Leggett. Which one do you feel fits Alex Van Pelt's scheme better? What do you think? Ooh, I think for Alex Van Pelt's scheme, just thinking about like what he was doing with the Browns, I think that Javon Baker is probably a little bit of a better fit. I think that like a guy like Xavier Leggett, you're probably asking him to do more of like what Elijah Moore was doing for the Browns last year, where like you're not really playing receiver, but you're doing a lot of like jet sweeps and you're doing a lot of these like little like hitch motions and stuff um, versus Baker, I think profiles more of like, not saying that he's going to be that player, but he profiles more of like a guy that would play kind of the role that Amari Cooper did for Cleveland this year. Okay. Um, and so I think like for the Patriots who, correct me if I'm wrong, don't really have a guy that fits that as of right now, um, I think, yeah, I think that Baker probably fits a little bit better, um, but both of them would certainly have a role in that offense and both of them would be able to to make an impact as rookies. I just think that like the Patriots have more guys that fill the role that Leggett would play than they have guys that would, that would fill the role that Baker would play in this offense. I agree. I'm like a big Xavier Leggett guy, but realistically, I was thinking the same thing. You're thinking of Amari Cooper. What's Amari Cooper's whole thing is the route running. Like, obviously, crazy talented, but when you think of Amari Cooper, you're thinking of him routing guys up. And Javon Baker, you talk about fluidity, the explosiveness, the nuance, all those things. I feel like he gives you that. Where Xavier Leggett, I do think he can be like a really good Z where you have him on the crossing routes and things like that. And I think he can be an X if you like the matchup. 
But I think he is better in that more like, you know, put him all over the place, primarily as he kind of role. Whereas Baker, I think you can put him at X and you can keep him there. If you want to give him ideal matchups and, you know, Amari Cooper lined up at other spots. It's, none of these guys are going to play in one space unless they really are just better off there. I think Javon Baker still has that flexibility, but I'd be much more comfortable with him sticking at that X role long term. Could Leggett kind of grow into that type of guy? Maybe. I really do like his upside, and I feel like once he gets more coaching and experience under his belt, he could be maybe like a bona fide X because he's got the size, he's got the power, he's got the catching ability and that speed. But again, Javon Baker, just like I think day one is going to be one of the better route runners, especially one of the better values if he goes in like the third or fourth where I'm seeing him projected. Also, yeah. where do you think Javon Baker's going to go? Because I've seen him anywhere from day two to day three, or to, uh, no, from the second round to the fourth round. I feel like he's a third round range like in the middle, but I'm curious where you yeah. are. Yeah, I think that I would expect him kind of in like the, the top to the middle of the third round. Maybe he sneaks up into like the end of the second if there's like a huge run on guys. Um, but like just kind of tearing it out mentally, I think that like there's a pretty clear tier, obviously at the top, I and mean, there's a pretty clear tier that's going to go like at the back end of the first, early part of the second. And then Baker's kind of part of that next tier, um, where I kind of expect like the run to start at the end of the second and kind of stretch into like the beginning, middle of the third. So that's kind of where I expect him to go. Um, but you're right, I, I've seen him anywhere between like pick. 40 and 100 it feels like draft season's the best it really it's very humbling <laughs> really when you're is. like oh damn i thought i i thought i knew everything and then no one has any consensus all right now we're kind of going to build off that another would you rather would you rather have mcconkey or leggett in the second with javon with patrick paul or javon foster in the third or kingsley suamatea or tyler guyton in the second and then jermaine burton javon baker or rice in the third i will say Jermaine Burton's not going to be on the Patriots board. Like Robert Kraft typically yeah. has like certain things that he will not tolerate. And Burton has done something that I, I don't think is really going to fly. Look it up if you want. I'm not going to get into it. But if it was in this kind of scenario, obviously you got a lot of choices here, but that lets you be creative. So which way would you lean with these two scenarios and who would your picks be? Yeah, I think, um, I think kind of building off of what we were just talking about, I think that that second scenario probably makes more sense to me. Um, and in that scenario, I think you probably, I personally like Sumataya more than I like Tyler Guyton. Um, I think that Guyton's a little bit more of a project guy. Um, I kind of see him as like a right tackle only. I know that other people think that he um, would be able to move over to the left side. I don't really see that with him. Um, with Sumataya, I do think that he could play either side. Um, obviously, he has a bunch of experience at right tackle, but um, played some left tackle um, as well. And I just think he's a better player right now. Um, and so I think I'd probably take Sumatai in the second, um, have him uh, be your left tackle, and then take a guy like Baker in the third um, and have him be kind of like your de facto X receiver. Um, maybe bring in, you know, like a, a vet that's still on the free agent market to kind of compete with him and mentor him a little bit um, as like a primary X. Um, but I think that that would probably be the move there, just because, again, like, with, with receivers like McConkie or Leggett or, or guys like that, I think we're talking about a little bit more of an overlap skill set wise with what the mm -hmm. Patriots already have. Um, like personally, um, because I'm a, like I go to the Shrine Bowl every year, like I'm a huge Pop Douglas guy. Um, <laughs> and so like, I'm excited to see what he can do in an offense like Van Pelt's um, with a little bit more of that stuff that like, like I mentioned, Elijah Moore was doing with the Browns, like a little bit more of that sweep sort of stuff, um, a little bit more of like even like what David Bell was doing out of the slot for Cleveland last year. Like I'm really high on Douglas and I'm really excited to see what he can do in that offense. And so that obviously colors my perception of this answer a little bit as well, because I'm kind of like, well, why would you take another slot receiver and have him do that stuff? You already have this guy. Um, and so I definitely get the argument both ways, but I think like that's the direction that I would be in. I agree. I like, I'll be happy. Like I said, if the Patriots get Leggett or Baker, if they get both, I'll be over the moon, but Baker in the third, I just feel like is such a great value, especially like yeah, all I these guys, that. I think are developmental prospects in some regard. Like I think Patrick Paul and Tyler Guyton could play right away. But like you said, with Guyton, so much experience at right tackle. If you're going to pick a guy in the second, I'd rather it not be a guy that you have to switch sides and where it's kind of a projection, unless you're very, very sure 
Javon yeah. Foster, I feel like, is more of a fourth round guy. And Patrick Paul, I like his skill set. If they take him, I'll be happy with it, especially in the third. I feel like that'd be a good value because he could probably sneak into that second round as well. But I yeah. feel like he loves the hug technique. Like he, he'll let guys get into his chest all the time. And I'm That's sure he'll get the kinks of that worked out with good coaching. But it's something in his game that really scares me because he's tough to get around. But at the same time, he does give up significant ground. So if he is going to yeah. be a guy yeah. where you take him because you're like, oh, yeah, he probably starts sooner than later. I feel like, honestly, I'd probably rather see Chooks Okorafor and like, hey, unless he cannot play on the left side and is strictly a right tackle, you know, let's just keep him there. Let's do him and tell you, uh, develop. I like his ceiling better than the rest of these guys. And again, I think Baker in the third round is great value. So I agree. Same page. Typical. Classic us. <laughs> All right. Now we're getting back to your Washington roots. Thoughts on Jalen Polk, Jalen McMillan. Who do you prefer? Now, I feel like this one's kind of unfair because they're like slated to go in pretty different spots. Unless you do have a difference, yeah. but either way, maybe sell us on because I've watched a lot of Polk. I haven't watched much of McMillan. So this is a learning experience for me. Yeah. So I think like to answer the question directly of like which one I prefer, I think that my answer is Polk, which pains me because McMillan was obviously at Washington longer. He's a guy that like was when I was a student like and so like I watched him for you know three four years at this point and like I love J-Mac um I think he's gonna be a great NFL player um but Polk has a very like it's almost like a Robert Woods to his game um where like he will do all of the stuff that your other receivers don't want to do like he'll do any of it and he can route you up on a post um, and so like he like he is the ultimate like He's never going to be a number one, I don't think, but he's going to be a rock solid number two for a decade. He's going to block his butt off. Um, like he is going to do everything in between um, catching the ball. Um, I think that the difference between them is that like Polk, while like small for being a guy like that ish, um, he is much more of like a prototypical like Z. Um, like he's going to be someone that you put out on the outside, um, have him run like a few more vertical routes, have him do more stuff kind of like with overs and that sort of thing. McMillan is much more of like a go over the middle, like typical like slot sort of guy. Um, and I think like one of the things that I think is really interesting about going back to the Michael Penix discussion is that like one of the criticisms that people have about Mike is that he didn't throw over the middle a ton at Washington this season. And I, I caution people with that because I want people to go back and watch Washington with Michael Penix and with Jalen McMillan on the field, and then Washington with Michael Penix without Jalen McMillan on the field. Uh -huh. Because McMillan was out for a good portion of this season, this playoff run, um, with like a lingering like ankle issue. And when McMillan is in, you can tell that there's a distinct difference in the way that they approach the offense because they're so much more comfortable with him than any other receiver over the middle. Um, and so that's something that like someone asked me about like back in like January and I went back and I looked and I was like, yeah, like if you're concerned about Mike's ability to throw over the middle, I would suggest that you go back and you watch the 2022 tape from when McMillan was fully healthy the entire year. Um, because like, there's a lot more of those reps on that film than there is this year because McMillan didn't play a ton. Um, but I think both of them are going to be great NFL receivers. Um, I think that Polk, obviously, like you talked about, they're going to go in kind of different ranges. I think Polk is going to be more of like a second rounder type guy um, mm -hmm. as like, again, kind of like a Robert Woods, maybe like a Josh Reynolds type player. Um, and McMillan is going to be more of a like third or fourth round guy. That's going to be more of a slot guy um, kind of, closer to like uh someone like jacoby myers um, okay. and, you know of like not necessarily like the most like standout athletic guy on the field um but just like makes the catches moves the chains over the middle like does like just like keeps the offense moving more so mm -hmm. than like gets into the end zone and like hits you with those explosive plays and stuff one, I'm a little bit higher on Penix knowing that. I did not have that context, so I'm going to have to go back and watch some of that 2022 film. It's funny because I actually liken Polk to Jacoby Myers, but, like, if he wasn't as nuanced of a route runner, which is not his fault, 
you run what you're yeah. asked to run. Yeah. A lot of these college programs keep it simple and like has a little bit more juice. Where Jacoby, like he'll hit you yeah. on a slot yeah. fade or like in a condensed split every once in a while. But Polk can legitimately stack guys once he gets like a speed release, they can get some ground going. McMillan, I got to dive into the tape. So do you think that it's the injuries and maybe like the lack of great size that's impacting his draft stock? Because it sounds like he should be someone who's going in the same range as Polk. Yeah, I do think so. I think that like he he is um, he is kind of the unfortunate victim of the trio of receivers that are that are in this draft because okay. like before Polk transferred in, like in the 2021 season, which almost nobody watched because it was awful and it was like before DeBoer got there and it was before Mike got there and it was like when everything was garbage and basically the only features of the team were Roma Dunze and Jalen McMillan. And that was like the only reason that you went to games, unless you're like a huge punting fan, which I am, but most people aren't. <laughs> right. Um, and Keep so, <laughs> right. And so, like those games, like that season, you look at that team and you're like, okay, well, they have two NFL receivers and nothing else. Mm -hmm. And then they add Polk from Texas Tech, they add Mike, they add Kalen DeBoer, they add this new offense. And immediately it was like, oh, like Polk is that guy. And Rome is taking another step forward and McMillan is taking another step forward, but he's kind of like the third guy now. And he's kind of just like another guy who is here, which is no fault of his. It's just like the way that Mike wanted to play, the way that Kalen DeBoer wanted to play, um, the way that that offense was structured didn't necessarily give him as many opportunities as the offenses from when the team was bad did. Um, and so I think he got less of a chance to showcase kind of like his skill set because the offense didn't really like mesh the best with what he's like best at. And then he had all the injuries and everything like going into 2023 and, you know, it was an ankle thing that just like would not go away. And he kept like, you know, like he missed a couple of weeks, then he'd come back and try to play through it. And then he'd miss a couple of weeks, then he'd come back and try to play through it. And it just like clearly like was never quite right. Um, and you know, like, I think, I do think that he's going to be a like bona fide receiver in the NFL. It's just, he didn't get a ton of opportunity because there's two other guys that are going to be wide receiver one and wide receiver two in the NFL mm -hmm. on his college team. Not to mention guys like Jeremy Bernard, who transferred to Alabama, who's going to be an NFL player and like guys that Washington was using as like role players because they're younger guys, but are like going to play in the league. And so it's just like it, it's just like a tough room to crack. Well, you can't knock McMillan for toughness. That's for damn sure. I'm <laughs> diving right. into the 2022 yeah. tape now for sure. I'm actually really excited. All right. I'm going to hit you with one more question before I get you out of here. Who are your top three dream defensive prospects that realistically could fall to the Patriots in the fourth round? Honestly, hands up, I have not watched a ton of defense. The Patriots have much bigger <laughs> priorities, and I have limited time, so I've only kind of gotten to watch guys that they've had in for visits. But it doesn't necessarily have to be three, but who are some guys that you think could potentially fall to New England early on day three that would fit what they do? Yeah, I think um, you're probably – let's see. What positions does New England need on defense? Bad <laughs> – a little bit of everything, sneakily. Honestly, oh, they need a center fielder. I think they could use a slot or a boundary corner, to be honest, and they could use some defensive line depth. Okay, okay. So I think, okay. like, <laughs> um, one guy that, that sticks out a little bit would be, like, uh, Dwayne Carter from Duke. Yes, yes. Um, he, Duke. He's one that I really like and, like, hasn't gotten a ton of buzz in this defensive tackle class as other guys have started to kind of rise up the board, like, there's been a lot of talk about like Brayden Fiske after his performance at the senior bowl, like Chris Jenkins from Michigan, like blew up the combine. Michael Hall has been like skyrocketing up boards. Um, but Carter is a guy that I really like. Uh, I really liked him since last summer um, at Duke. And I think like he's someone that could be like a pretty good rotational piece at defensive tackle. Um, I think uh, cornerback wise, like a guy like uh, Kalen Carson from Wake Forest, um, mm -hmm. is one that I really like. I was really high on him as like a potential like second or third rounder super early in the year and then just like never really quite put it all together. Um, it looks like he's about at about like 108 on the consensus board right now. Um, but he's someone that like I like kind of in that same vein, like Cam Hart from Notre Dame, who I think is going to end up going a lot higher. Um, but it seems like people are like not quite 
caught up on him. There are like some people that have him in like a top 75, 100 ish. And then there are people that have him down at like 125, 130. Um, but he's a guy that like is going to be a great like zone corner, like cover three, like isn't going to be a super like twitched up, like again, kind of what we were talking about with Richardson. Like isn't going to be like a super like twitched up, like follow receivers like as they run these like Hunter Renfro whip routes and stuff. But like <laughs> if you put him in like a deep third or a deep quarter even and like just have him like read and react, um, I think he's going to be a, a great player in that respect. Um, and then let's see, just looking at other ones here. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, I think a guy like Jalen Simpson from Auburn is – Nice. Uh, is another one like kind of like could fit both that nickel role but also that center fielder role um, mm -hmm. depending on how you want to deploy him um, obviously with the Patriots defense the whole thing is multiplicity um, yeah. and so like he's someone that fits into that pretty seamlessly of like you know you can you can do a lot of rotational stuff with your safeties if you have a tandem of Simpson and Kyle Duggar and you know whoever else that you get the, uh, that's out there just like where you can show one look and then you can have those guys rotate where then simpson rotates into the nickel dugger maybe steps back and plays more of like a, a center fielder type role on play uh do the opposite on the next play and like um he's someone that like i think is going to be available on day three just because he's like more of a tweener player like he doesn't really have prototypical safety Probably. size <laughs> but yeah, but he isn't really like a prototypical nickel either. Um, and so, but he's someone that I really like, and I think he's going to be a, a quality uh, role player in the NFL as well. I actually did know about two of those three guys, so I'm a little more tempted <laughs> than I thought. That makes me feel pretty happy. I'll throw one name in the ring, and you tell me if this is a guy that you've watched and you can elaborate more on. Austin Booker. Now, again, the guys yeah. that I've watched any tape yeah. on, not even tape, honestly, I like will watch the highlights, and if I don't really get a good feel from that. I'll watch the tape just to like get an idea of what these guys are about. Just looking at the highlights for Booker, he had a win with like a pure clean win, not like, you know, three seconds into the play, high effort, like no, like clean, easy wins with a different move in every clip. And I'm like, damn, then I look into it and he's new to the position. He's still growing into like the actual role. So yeah. if you're talking about a team that has Josh Uche on a one-year deal, after a down season where you don't really know what they're going to do with him, but I do think the Patriots are going to let their edge rushers off the leash a little bit because obviously the prototype for them has been like really we're trying to condense the pocket more than anything. Uche, Uche was kind of an awkward fit, especially last year. I feel like they're right. going to get away from that, so Booker would really be able to shine. Obviously, Matthew Judon, not getting any younger, he's probably going to survive on like one- and two-year deals for the rest of his career. So Booker was a guy where I was like, hey, if you can bulk him up more so he can be better against the run, and automatically you can put him on the field in obvious pass situations and have like a bona fide stud off the edge who's still learning and already has a ton of tools in his bag, he's a guy that I think could be really exciting if he does slip to them in the fourth round once they've addressed, obviously, quarterback, receiver, and tackle. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that that's a good one, too. Um, he is, like, if you want to take a home run swing on a guy, like, which a lot of teams do with their day three picks because, like, what else are you going to do? Um, I think that he's, like, a, a perfect guy for that sort of thing. And I think, like, the, the comparison that you made to Uche is a great one because, uh, like, he's super raw. Like, the, like those highlights are, like, 60% of the plays that he played, period. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, and so, like, it's a really small sample size. Like, it almost reminds me of, like, a, a Boye Mafe, like, Joseph Asai type guy, um, where it was just, like, there's not a lot here to, like, prove that you are, like, an NFL player, but there are clear flashes of it. And, like, I think that his best case scenario is well maybe not best case because his best case scenario is probably that like he's just max crosby but i think that like his like 80th percentile outcome is that he's josh uche where mm -hmm. like he can be a rotational pass rusher that brings some juice off the edge maybe isn't going to be ever like a great run defender or a great pocket collapser but it's going to be someone that could just like pull a move out of their toolbox at will get to the quarterback on like a third down where like you just have to have it um mm -hmm. And so, like you mentioned, like with Uche on a one-year deal and, you know, uh, the the future of the edge room looking like a little bit cloudier uh, in New England, I think that that's a great 
option for them um, mm -hmm. to kind of like take that next step towards like, okay, like this is our replacement for Uche and then like in the 2025 class for the better edge rusher class, at least as it looks right now in the spring, a full year before the draft, um, you can try to kind of find, start to find your replacement for, for Judon and move forward with that as like your future edge tandem. Manifesting a fourth round slip for Austin Booker. Alex, this was awesome, man. I had a great time. Appreciate you taking the time. So please, before we wrap it up, let the people rem know, remind them where they can find you and let them know what fantastic stuff you got coming down the pipeline that they should be looking out for. Yeah, I mean, uh, at this point, with as many places as I'm in, the easiest place to find me is probably just on Twitter. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's at Alex Katzen, the same way you see it spelled on the screen here. Um, that's where all of my stuff lives. Um, I'm all over the place, uh, like Taylor's mentioned a couple times at this point, um, but mostly over at Chargers Wire and Oscars Wire with USA Today. Um, I got uh, a Charger-specific podcast that I do work with, my own podcast that I do work with. Uh, I've got all sorts of stuff happening, all sorts of stuff going in like 12 different places all the time. Um, so really, Twitter is the best place to uh, to catch up with all of it and make sure that you're getting all of it. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it was a great time. Always uh, always good to uh, see your face again um, after our uh, adventures in Indianapolis. And I uh, hope I can come back soon. You will, buddy. Thank you so much. If you couldn't tell already, Alex is the president of Team No Sleep, <laughs> but we benefit. He is so damn selfless. Thank you again, buddy. Appreciate you taking the time. And thank you all for watching, as always. Now,